also read lately that there's something sacred about holding a Bible when you read scripture versus a cell phone or a computer, and I guess a screen. So I used to copy it out on a piece of paper that I could, but I didn't do that today. I'm going to read from this wonderful old Bible. So I'm reading from Ruth chapter one, uh, verses eight through 18. And remember here, Ruth and her family have been in Midian for 10 years already, 10 years. So, then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. The story of Ruth is a memorable one in that it reminds us that the decisions we make today affect our tomorrows. The little ones as well as the big ones color our future. Every decision is consequential. But even more so, the person you are today and the choices you make will, make not, only, will not only affect your life, but the lives of countless others. Most people have heard our passage today. It's often used in wedding ceremonies as one person from one family unites with another. It speaks of a deep commitment. Yet the truth is, it may be the only thing that most of us know about the book of Ruth. Those simple but powerful words. Over the last seven weeks, we've been studying the book here in one of our small groups. And, and with that, I have to say this. Just as an aside, a small group Bible study is a great way to meet other people and to grow in your knowledge of the Bible. I want to encourage you this fall to look at some of these opportunities and if you're able to take part in them. And if your schedule is too busy in the fall, look at the ones in the winter and the spring. Small groups stretch your faith and build your confidence. This fall we're offering eight different studies. And there's going to be an online study with Reverend Josh McClure as well as several others here at the church. Uh, next week we'll have flyers and make sure to pick one up and see if there's one that fits your schedule or your liking. And also this, if you have something you'd like to study, a book of the Bible, maybe a topic, let me know and we can put that in the works for the future. Well, on that fateful day, Ruth made a decision. It was a decision that started a chain reaction that has affected every one of our lives. We are who we are today because of Ruth. Now you say, how is that? She lived hundreds of years ago. Well, if you think I'm kidding, here's the rest of the story. Ruth was a Moabite woman who married into a Jewish family. 
But this was not the normal path that good Jews took. Often they avoided the stranger, those who weren't part of their, their kin and their kindred. But Elimelech, Naomi's husband, took his family and they moved to Moab because of a famine in the land. They were looking for help. They wanted to stay alive and so they went traveling. Now it's an odd decision to make because the Moabites were sworn enemies of the Jewish people. If you read down through history, you'll see that the Moabites beat them up. It's kind of like going to the big bully for help. They were a vulgar and profane people. Just think Las Vegas. I'm going to go to Las Vegas and I'm going to make my way. No, no, it's not the thing that many good-hearted Christian people would do. For ten years, she lived with them in this stark contrast to what Judaism was all about. Yet this choice of living with Naomi and Elimelech and the boys, the men, changed her life. It rubbed off on her the Jewish way of thinking. And then when misfortune happened and her husband, her brother-in-law, and her father-in-law died, she had established such a loving relationship with her mother-in-law, Naomi, that she decided to give up her heritage, even what it was, to go back to Bethlehem and Judea with Naomi. When Naomi tried to dissuade her, she uttered those famous words that we heard a moment ago. It was a true confession of faith, one that stands out in time as an example of commitment. I will go where you go. I will stay where you stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God from now and forevermore. What's even more amazing about Ruth's statement is the fact that she says it in the face of great loss. But she gets it. She understands that the God of the Jews, the creator of the universe, is in charge of everything. He has plans that she will never understand that extend beyond her life. She says, I will trust this God of yours because he is my God now. You know, I've heard these words echoed by many over the years as they've let go of a spouse or a child. It's not that they don't care. It's that they trust God to be God and to let their loved ones go and to give them up to the Lord. At a funeral a couple of weeks ago, and that's exactly what the wife said. She said, this is breaking my heart. And yet the moment I decided to give him up and to trust God, I felt his peace because I knew where he was going. Here's what's amazing about Ruth's story. She doesn't know it, but that decision that day put her in a place where God could use her to bring salvation to the whole world. Here she was a Moabite. She wasn't even a Jew. And yet that decision to make the God, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrew people, her God, to make their people, her people, to become one of them would be a blessing to her. Because not only would God bring a man named Boaz into her life who would rescue her, redeem her, and then marry her, but she would give birth to a son, and that son would have a son, and that son would have a son, and his name would be David, the king, the great king. And we know that in David's line, years later, a savior would be born whose name was Jesus Christ. Who would have known that that day when Ruth said, your God will be my God, that God would then include her in the line of our Savior. Her faithfulness was rewarded generations later with the one who would be the Savior for the whole world, for the Moabites as well as the Jews, and for every nation under earth for those who believe. It's like Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story. It seemed like an inconsequential decision. Ruth didn't really have much in Moab, but she cared for her mother-in-law, Naomi, and saw that she was hurting and decided to cast her lot in with her and head back to Bethlehem, the house of bread. There was uncertainty, and she threw it to the wind and decided to trust God. And some of us have been in that situation. Our world seems to be turned upside down. We don't know what the future holds, but we say, well, I'm just going to trust you, God. I'm going to ask you to hold my hand and walk me through it. And I know that when we get to the other side together, that you will still be with me. 
you will not let me go. What's amazing about this story is that it points out some facts about our faith and the decisions we make. The first thing to note is this, that how you live and let your faith lead you is on display for others to see. Ruth didn't just wake up and decide she wanted to follow God. She had lived with Naomi for 10 years. Ten years of watching this woman, the wife of a great Jewish man, live out her life in faith, following her husband, trusting God to provide for them. She watched all the nuances of what that meant as she raised her sons and then became the mother-in-law to these women. And there was something in the way she lived and the way that her faith led her that touched Ruth's heart. She watched the way that Naomi approached life and how faith informed every decision. You know, sometimes we lose track of that in this story because we see Naomi at her worst. Naomi, after the loss of her husband and her sons, says, call me bitter now because God has left me. And yet there were ten years where that faith was strong and Ruth witnessed that. It was the faith that Naomi lived that touched Ruth's heart to help her make that big decision and embrace the God of Israel. You know, people are watching you and me. We joke about everyone having a phone now, a cell phone, and so I know some of us are scared to death that, that we might be caught doing something stupid and then they'll let the whole world know about it. Well, maybe not you because you would never do anything foolish or crazy, right? Sometimes it doesn't matter because just a little snippet can catch us at our worst. But the truth is, long before there were cell phones, people were watching us when we confessed Christ as our Lord, looking for us to slip up, for us to fall, for us to do something that was not Christ-worthy so that they could point their finger and say, Ah, those Christians! When we say we're a Christian, people watch us more closely for the bad and for the good. Several years ago, um, I received one of the greatest compliments that I have ever received in my life. And it came in a moment, a very difficult moment in my ministry. A few people were unhappy with, with how I had handled the situation. And so they began talking. And they began talking to one another. And then they began to try to talk to others in the congregation to turn them against me. But following scriptural guidelines, I went to talk with them seemed to make no difference. They just had this, this bug in their bonnet. And their minds were made up. Eventually, they left the church. And one of my deacons said to me afterwards, and this is a compliment, he said, I have to tell you that you modeled the love of Christ in dealing with them. You never became angry or vindictive. You treated them completely with love and respect and forgiveness. And I don't know if I could have done so. But I would have wanted to be more like you when that comes my way. You see, people are watching. And Ruth had witnessed Naomi's faith firsthand and influenced her greatly. The time they spent together only solidified that feeling. You know, it's good to spend time with others. Not only your church friends, but your other friends too. I have a friend named Cliff. And, and Cliff had kind of a rough life before he became a Christian. He was one of those people who had that miraculous awakening, a, a, a Paul experience, Damascus Road-like, where suddenly he became a Christian. And, and again, some of these friends who knew him before kept wondering if it was real or not. And Cliff, though, kept hanging out with them, playing golf with them, meeting them at different events and whatnot. And um, they all knew that he had accepted Christ. He didn't hide it and he didn't push it on them. But he hoped that one day something he did would rub off on them. Something he said might be a seed planted in their heart to change their lives. In order for this to happen though, you have to be totally committed to Christ. You can't give in to the world and play the games and do what others do. You have to be on solid ground saying, I'm going to follow Christ and I'm going to follow His way. Turn your back away from the worldly ways. And only keep your eyes on Jesus. You can't be like everyone else and turn on and turn off your Christian values. You have to main, remain true to Jesus. And this is what will make people notice. Here's the second thing I can tell you. Once you make a decision like this for Christ, your faith 
will be tested. No one gets a pass in this life. The devil will work extra hard to knock you down once you've made a decision to follow Christ. When you're committed to be an example to others, the devil will try to knock you off your stoop. The temptations, the difficulties, the sorrows that come will test your faith. I wish I could say to you, once you've accepted Christ, once you've made that decision, your God will be my God and begin to follow Him. I wish I could say that everything is going to be smooth. You're going to have blessing after blessing. I tell everyone who is baptized, I say now is just the beginning. Expect the trials to come. When someone tells you that, you say, why would I ever want to be a Christian? But the truth is, is that Christ has promised that when the trials come, when the challenges come, when the difficulties come, He will stand with you when you face them. Ruth was gung-ho to follow Naomi and embrace her God and her people, but life was not easy from the get-go. She was poor and had nothing. When they got back to Bethlehem, they were facing starvation. Not only that, but her mother-in-law's strong faith, which had buoyed her in the land of Moab, had disappeared, and she was stuck with a bitter old woman. And it makes you want to cry, but that's life. My friend Cliff came down with cancer. It was heartbreaking. I remember one of the hardest days of my life was when he came to me and said, I've always felt the experience and the presence of God, and right now I don't feel him. I think he's abandoned me. And I thought of Christ on the cross at his darkest hour saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? How can it appear, how can it feel like in your darkest hour when you've been so faithful to God, how can it feel like God is gone, God has left you, God has abandoned you? But Cliff was later to say that although he didn't feel or wasn't aware of God's presence, God was there. Praise God, Cliff is still with us and in total remission 26 years later. God had walked through that difficult path. When you're facing those trials, the simple response needs to be drawn closer to Christ. You need to let Him be your rock and your shield. That's the third point we get from this story. Ruth put herself in God's hands and when the test came. She declared, your God will be my God. Even though they had nothing else, Ruth stood firm in her claim that God belonged to her and she belonged to God. She decided that she was going to sink or swim with that faith. She was going to trust Him all the way. And what happened? God provided a way out of the despair. It came out of nowhere. Her mother-in-law suggested she go with all the other poor widows and go and glean in the fields. There was a provision in the Jewish law that, that, that the landholders would let the, the scraps fall around the outside and the poor and the widows could come and take them. And so she went to this field <coughs> and it just so happened, it just so happened, that when she came to this field, it was a field that belonged to a man named Boaz. Boaz noticed her and took an interest in her plight. And all throughout the story, we see God's hands in these coincidences that seem to happen. She goes to this field. Boaz is unmarried, single man. Sees her, takes notice of her work ethic and how she is there. Begins to ask about her, hears her story, how she's come back with her mother-in-law and is caring for her mother-in-law. And he takes mercy on her and tells his servants, leave her alone, give her extra, take care of her. It's a beautiful story. He provides the protection for her and ends up at the end of the story redeeming her when he learns of a family connection to Naomi. In the end, he marries her and the blessing, the blessing of God is upon her and things come full circle and the reader of this story sees God in every frame. The truth is that God reveals himself all the time in the circumstances of our lives. Naomi recognized it and encouraged Ruth to pursue the openings that God had made. We need to keep our eyes open because there is no such thing as a coincidence. When things seem to come together in a perfect way, that is the hand of God opening opportunities for us. 
When we feel the nudge of the Holy Spirit and we follow that and we see the blessings that come from it, it is certainly the hand of God. There's no greater testimony than to point this out to a friend who may not be a believer. When you begin to see these things happening and tell others, it could very well lead them to coming to faith or to a friend at church growing stronger in their faith. That's why the deacons are talking about inviting people to share short testimonies in our worship service of what God has done for them. Because sometimes we see these things happening in our lives, but we don't even realize it's a blessing from God. How God was there for us in a time of trouble or trial. How God opened a door for us when we thought that all the doors and windows were closed. How God was with us in this moment of illness and He turned that around to become a blessing. You see, God is always with those who call on Him. That's the promise of Scripture. And the promise is, the problem is we don't call on Him enough. Finally, the most important decision we can make is to join with others as we walk through life. <clears throat> Yesterday, I was flipping through the channels, and I, I think it's Me TV or Fee TV or something, but the Lone Ranger was on there. I, anybody remember the Lone Ranger? You know, I had to look it up. It's great. You know, I kind of use the internet when I'm watching TV or at movies, and, and so I looked it up, and the Lone Ranger was on TV from 1949 to 1957. Can you believe that? But we often talk about someone who tries to do it on their own as being a lone ranger. When you're not in, uh, involving anybody else, when you're, you're going to be the hero, you're going to be the protagonist in some story, oh, he's just a lone ranger, oh, she's a lone ranger, she doesn't accept help. But do you know what the interesting thing about the lone ranger is? He was never alone. His faithful friend Tonto was there. And anything they did that turned out to be good was because the two of them were working together in tandem with one another. And I don't know why Tonto doesn't give his credit. Jay Silverheels played Tonto the whole time in that television series. He was a Canadian actor, no, <laughs> part of a tribe. But the point is, is that even the Lone Ranger knew that to succeed he had to have another. And the truth is that's why God created the church because we can't be lone rangers out in this world. The Apostle Paul says that when we're out there on our own, the devil is out there like an angry lion ready, lion, ready to pounce and to take whoever he can. And so we never want to be alone. We want to be with others. And maybe that's why Ruth decided to go with Naomi, because she knew she had nothing in Moab. There was no one there. But in Naomi, she found someone who she could live her life with. And maybe there's a lesson in that for all of us. The truth is that we are stronger together than we are alone. The decision to join a church, to get involved in one, is one that can change your life. Not only will your faith grow, but so will your relationship to God. One stick can easily be broken, but bind them together, a bundle of sticks, even a strong man can't break. That's why God established the church he knew that we needed one another to be able to stand strong and deliver the gospel to the world. Ruth understood this when she said, your people will be my people. She wasn't saying you will be my people, your people will be my people. And as you read through that story, you see the community came together around Naomi and Boaz and Ruth. Sure enough, she found her redeemer in there, in that community and in life as well. Most of us make a hundred decisions a day. Every decision has consequences. We shouldn't be afraid of them, but we should invite God into the process. We often do that with the big things. You're trying to see if you want a new job or not. You're going to move. Maybe you're getting ready. You've been uh, dating someone for a while and you want to know, is this the one? And you go to God with these big decisions. But I want to say to you that the best way to live life is to invite God into your every day so that every decision is one that you make with Him. Now this sounds silly. But even a decision like whether you should have an ice cream cone or not. You say, well, what does that matter? Well, you know, if God was in those decisions, you might choose rightly. 
But invite God into your everyday. When you get out of bed in the morning, say, Lord, I want you to walk with me today. That could be the best decision you make that day. Because as he walks with you, you will see opportunities. Your eyes will be open to things you never saw before. And the decisions, the choices you make will be better choices because you're walking with the Lord. You know, God puts people in our lives for a reason. Bianca Juarez Oltoff, who led the Ruth Bible study in our video series, said that when we are redeemed and we see what God has done for us, it makes us realize that we have a role in redeeming others too. We're not here for ourselves. And it may be that God puts people in your lives that you may be able to influence for the glory of God. Maybe just your presence. Maybe just a few words you have to say to them as you pass during the day. But when you walk with God, God makes these opportunities possible. We are here because they are here. And we are here because God wants to bring us together so that he can do something for them like he's done in us. So make a decision to go to God and invite him in. And then give your life to Him so that you can serve Him. And when you do, just wait and see. Watch what happens as God works out His plans through you. Make a decision. If you haven't made a decision to follow Christ yet, make this the day you make that decision. I will follow you. And then follow through on that and say, Lord, walk with me. And watch what happens. Amen. We're going to close.